All right, let's start with this very general relationship that we derived in the previous video and assume that all embeddings are hypersurfaces. So we will assume that the surface is a hypersurface with respect to the ambient space and the curve within the surface is a hypersurface with respect to that surface. So the best thing to think about is a one-dimensional curve embedded in a two-dimensional surface embedded in the overall three-dimensional space. Maybe it's the most common example for everyday life. Great to visualize, easy to imagine, and just a great example. So that's what we're going to work with. And so here is, I draw that, not a great drawing, but that possible situation. We have a three-dimensional space. Here's a two-dimensional surface. Within it is a one-dimensional curve. And let me introduce this normal. So this is a normal because now this curve is a hypersurface with respect to the surface that it's in. It has a well-defined normal. Maybe not so well-defined because it can also point in the other direction, but one of two directions. And it's denoted by the little letter N, and you'll see why these lowercase letters are also essential. Well, right here you see that we couldn't have used capital letter N because that's used for this normal. This is the normal of to the surface, in the ambient space because it is a hypersurface in that embedding. So here we go. And of course, it lies within the tangent plane. I think that's easy, that's easy to visualize, that's definition, but it makes sense. So it has well-defined coordinates and alpha. And I'll say something about that in a moment. But an alpha is, a, is about to appear right away because what this object is, being the curvature normal tensor, as we're calling it, of the curve as embedded in the surface. But now that we're considering the special case of the hypersurface, this will be N alpha times the proper curvature tensor, B phi psi. Right? Unfamiliar symbols, lowercase b, capital Greek indices, so that's all very unfamiliar, but all the concepts are very familiar. And the reason why they arise is because now we're just considering several objects at the same time. So you need a new type of letter, lowercase b, and a new alphabet. But all of the concepts come very neatly from what we discussed before. Okay, so that will be one. This will be this little n alpha times the curvature tensor of that hyper embedding. And of course, this will break up into ni b alpha beta, which you saw a couple of videos ago. And there's nothing we can do with this object because this is not a hypersurface. A curve, this curve, in the overall space is not a hypersurface. It's just a one-dimensional curve in a three-dimensional space. So that object stays as is. But the rest, you can use the word simplify. B, I, phi, psi equals, let's see what we have here, N, I. B alpha beta, our most familiar curvature tensor, times S alpha phi, S beta psi, plus, all right, hopefully you'll have this mental image in your mind, but I now need the space, so I'm erasing this beautiful drawing. All right, so little n alpha times b phi psi, and this is also a very familiar object, All right? That's our, that's the conventional curvature tensor. It's just that it works for the curve surface system. It's the curve as a hypersurface embedded in the surface, times Z I alpha. Now, something very interesting is happening here. If you look at this contraction, this is actually quite meaningful. It's too bad that I erased the drawing, but you remember what it looked like. So these are the in-plane components of the normal to the curve as it lies in the surface. And because it lies in the tangent plane, it's perfectly, uh, it's all good 
it's, it's expected that it has surface components. But you can also think of that little yellow vector as a vector in the three-dimensional space. Because it, yes, its base is on the curve, but it points to somewhere in the three-dimensional case, in the three-dimensional space. So you can ask what are its components with respect to the three-dimensional ambient basis. And those would be called little n i. And from everything we've discussed before, of course, little n i equals little n alpha times z i alpha. This is that lifting off of the plane into the space, translating surface components to ambient coordinates. And of course, we did a whole lecture on how the shift tensor does it. So of course, this is little, excuse me, little ni, little ni. Okay, and this is our familiar curvature tensor, but for the new embedding. So here's what we're going to do. So ni will appear in the next step, but here's what we're going to do. We're going to raise the Greek index and contract. And you will see this will be ni, this will be mean curvature, but of the curve with respect to the surface. This will become, and something interesting will happen here. So let's see what happens. But before I write it down, do you see how easy everything is and how completely straightforward everything is and how I'm more or less able to turn off my geometric intuition completely and just proceed algebraically? And I find that it's one of the most effective ways of thinking use geometry to set up the algebraic or analytical problem, and then proceed analytically. Let the analysis and the tensor framework dictate what the next step is, not the geometric intuition. Get to the final answer, and then interpret that final answer geometrically. I find that to be the most effective way of thinking. So what to do here is basically, I'm just looking at the notation and the tensor framework and not really thinking about the meaning uh, behind these objects. It's not necessary. That's really the power of the tensor uh, framework. It delivers on the promise of combining the power of analytical methods with the power of geometric methods. So, here we would get B I phi phi. We could talk about what the proper order of indices is. I always think of this one as first. And because of the symmetry, I don't really have to care about which one's second, which one's third. Right? If I did, if there was no symmetry here, I would very much space them in a way that makes that order clear. Equals N I B alpha beta. All right. S alpha phi S beta phi, because we raised and contracted, very good, plus b phi phi, beautiful object, mean curvature, my favorite, doesn't look as pretty as b alpha alpha, but it's every bit as beautiful, times an i. So that's an i that makes the appearance, as promised. So. This is actually very interesting. Uh, for reasons that will become apparent much later. So I will actually save this concept, the concept of geodesics, until we talk about moving surfaces. Moving surfaces is the best way to talk about geodesics because, after all, they are a minimization problem. And so it's a shape optimization problem for which uh, moving surfaces provide one of the best frameworks for analysis. So we think of this as mean curvature, and I insist that that's the primary way of thinking about this object, mean curvature. But in a later context, this object, uh, which you should think of as mean curvature because that's all it is, will actually pick up another name. This very object, this very object that depends on the choice of the normal, and has all of the properties of mean curvature, will also be known for one-dimensional surfaces as geodesic curvature. But as far as I'm concerned, for a majority, overwhelming majority of applications, if not all applications, uh, you can think of this as 
mean curvature. And geodesic curvature is just another name for it. Okay, that's great. Uh, I should almost box this, except of course, further work can be done here. So maybe it's once again time to pause the video to recall that these are nothing but shift tensors. And these are shift tensors contracted by the lesser dimensional index. So you should pause the video, think about it's that wonderful projection formula and figure out how to translate that projection formula. It's really not translating, it's renaming so that it applies to this case. But let me write down what it is. So let me say what this will equal so I can do the multiplication out in the next step. So I'll do it in yellow just so that there is no clash. And what this wonderful object will be is S alpha beta, the shift tensor, minus N alpha N beta. It comes from that projection formula. It's really not a translation of it, just a recognition of the exact same fact in a slightly different context. So let's see what, what we now have. We now, excuse me, we now have B, I, phi, phi equals N, I, well, it's just will be this term will be the first term. So that's just B alpha alpha, my favorite object, always nice when it shows up, minus N, I, N alpha, N beta. N, I, excuse me, B alpha beta. and alpha, and beta. Okay, that's wonderful. Plus this unchanged, plus B, psi, psi, and I. All right, and this is a relationship that's worth boxing because while the box relationship on the left board related so-called, so to speak, curvature tensors. The object on the left relates mean curvatures. Here is the mean curvature on the surface. This is not really mean curvature, but this term is completely unavoidable. And this is the mean curvature of the curve within, of the curve within the surface, right? And what we have on the left is, would be called curvature normal, but of course it's very much emotionally at least related to the concept of mean curvature. So here's our new boxed expression that relates mean curvatures. Here is an interesting way to think about this relationship. You can think about it as saying two different things in two different spaces because it has this component, which points in the direction normal to the surface. And it also has this component, which is in the direction normal to the curve. And I think it's worth it if I repeat the picture, even if it's rough. All right, so here we have our curve. And let's consider the direction in which all of these terms point. So this the only thing we know about this term is that it's orthogonal to this curve, but it lies in the overall three-dimensional space. So it points orthogonal to the curve, but we can't quite know its exact direction other than it's orthogonal to the curve. Well, this tells you exactly what the components of this term is, because being in this normal plane to the curve, it can be broken up into two directions tangential to the curve, excuse me, tangential to the surface and orthogonal to the surface. All right, so you see that in this plane there are two directions, tangential to the surface and, excuse me, normal to the surface and tangential to the surface. 
So the component of this object that's tangential to the surface, that's right here, it's proportional to the geodesic curvature, or maybe mean curvature, of the curve within the surface. And its component in the direction normal to the surface is right here. It's basically mean curvature minus this invariant. Right? So let's pause here, think about this a little bit more, and when we come back, we'll uh, consider what goes on in this normal direction. Nothing much is going on in the tangential direction. All we know is that the length of this vector in its tangential direction, its component, is just the mean, this mean curvature of the curve with respect to the surface. Maybe you want to call it geodesic curvature. But something quite exciting is happening in the normal space, which is obtained by dotting this entire relationship with the normal ni.